Excited to be here. My name is Colin Levy. I am a filmmaker uh, currently living in Los Angeles. Um, I rec recently realized that I have been using Blender at this point for over half my life. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's great to be here again in Amsterdam. Um, was here last for Agent 327, um, and uh, this time want to talk about my the passion project that's been taking the last five years of my life, Skywatch. Um, I'm here with my visual effects supervisor Sandro Blattner and our uh, 3D lead Pavel Shimoji <laughs> from Poland. Um, we've been working together for like three years, and this conference is the first time at we've actually all met together at the same time. Um, so I hope that some of you were able to catch the movie at the Suzanne Awards last night. Um, you guys are the very first audience to see it. Not completely done, but we're getting very close. Um, so that was a really exciting moment for us. Um, for those who haven't seen it or watching online, uh, Skywatch is a sci-fi proof of concept short um, about a couple of hacker kids in the future who get in over their heads. Um, it's live action, about 10 minutes, tons of visual effects work, all done in Blender. Um, so this is a visual effects talk. There's lots to um, get through. We'll try to do it quickly. Um, but we're, we're excited, excited to be releasing the short online very shortly. Um, in the meantime, just want to start off with the teaser trailer. All right, who's next? Dude, this is so bad. Just one more swap shot. We're gonna get caught. Hold on, hold on, check it out. Oh. This is the perfect swap. What is it? Oh, you'll see. <laughs> Enjoy your order. Mike, what's it doing? I'm getting an error in the drone. Oh my god. Attention. You are in breach of the next door corporation's terms of service agreement. Please remain where you are and someone will arrive to assist you. So, uh, we have been working on this film for a while. Uh, some of you might remember back in 2014, we did a call for artist help. Um, and it, does anyone remember that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so far uh, ago that we barely can remember. Um, yeah, so last year we, were, we, we did a Kickstarter um, and we're very lucky to raise uh, $50,000, uh, really exceeded our expectations. Um, and for that, I, ho I owe a, a huge thanks to the Blender community. You guys uh, really supported this project. Um, if you did back it and you haven't said hi, I would love to meet you and thank you in person. Free hugs to all my backers. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you. We have spent all your money. Um, couldn't have done it without you. Uh, even though uh, we did you know, have a chunk of change to, to work through, um, to do work at the level we were trying to do proved to be uh, pretty challenging, um, and it kind of came down a lot of it to me and Sandro uh, uh, kind of sitting down and churning through shot after shot. Um, we had a ton of help, uh, which we'll go into a little later, but um, I just want to talk about Sandro, who is uh, my guardian angel on this project. Um, I'm excited to be sharing the stage with him. He's a, he works by day as a compositing su supervisor at Method uh, Visual Effects Studios. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna hand it over to him for a quick overview of the visual effects challenges for Skywatch. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, everyone. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, we've been uh, waiting for this moment for a long time. Um, so, uh, yeah, like Colin mentioned, just wanna go over some uh, stats of the project. We had a total of 202 visual effect shots, um, which is pretty ambitious for a 10-minute short. Uh, we had over 60 artists uh, contributing uh, across the globe, um, and it was all remotely, um, and people working in their free time and on weekends. And we had four small-ish VFX vendors offering their help as well, which was huge. We had a VFX budget of around $35,000, which uh, mostly came from the Kickstarter. So thank you everyone who uh, backed us on that. Um, we spent four years in post-production, which is a very long time for 10 minutes. Um, 
And uh, two and a half years of that was shop production. So there was about a year or so of editing and um, post visiting and doing some pickups. And then we kind of dove into the shot work after that. And the primary tools on this project were Blender and Nuke. We pretty much used Blender for just about all the CG. Uh, it was about 95% of the CG work was done in Blender. And uh, the compositing was done in Nuke. Um, so here's just a little snippet of the spreadsheet that we had to deal with. So uh, uh, project management was pretty uh, rudimentary. Uh, we used spreadsheets and Google Drives and Dropbox and all that stuff. Uh, we also used a free tool called Productive, which no longer exists um, to manage our tasks. Um, but that was pretty much how we, uh, how we ran it. And uh, so yeah, uh, I would say let's just dive into the actual work of it, and I'll hand it back to Colin to talk more about the previous and post his work that he did in Blender. Um, so we're going to get to some juicy renders in a, we're going to go back and forth. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to get into some, some render stuff, uh, uh, pretty images shortly. But I want to talk about pre -viz and post -viz, which is probably what I spent just as long on, um, honestly. Um, and uh, Blender for me has been a crucial tool in all the films that I've made, um, which are all shorts. Um, uh, just in the, in the process of, of figuring out what I want to make, uh, just in the planning process, as crucial as screenwriting. Um, so I want to talk about uh, this previs, um, which you'll see is pretty shot for shot. In the, in the weeks leading up to production, I did a bunch of previs work to help us figure out what exactly we were going to shoot. Um, so I set up the sets and um, the camera and blender to accurately represent the locations we were going to be in, uh, as well as the lens kit we were going to use, so we could really know exactly where, when we got to the day, to you know to place the camera and how to frame the shot. Um, but equally as important as previs was postvis, which is basically the process once you've actually shot the thing. Um, if there's going to be a lot of CG elements within the frame, um, just kind of taking that, that plate and um, like this uh, the drone plate here um, and placing it within the context of a shot that is working. Um, so I did a lot of cheap iterative work. In, in Blender and After Effects, um, just trying to do as loose of a, a job as possible just to figure out the flow of a sequence or a scene. Um, and that was really crucial and took over a year on this project. Um, I also want to talk about the opening uh, Nextport commercial, which is sort of a spec. It's a very ambitious spec commercial for a futuristic uh, technology. Um, and this is another thing that the Kickstarter helped us produce. We had a, 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 a stretch goal um, that we were able to meet and allowed us to, to shoot this thing as an additional um, project within the project. Um, and I basically had this idea for a, a spinning camera move um, that swoops through walls uh, to show mean? four separate vignettes of, of customers yeah. basically receiving an order at their what next portal mean? appliances. Um, and I was really excited to do this. Wasn't exactly yeah. sure if we could technically yeah. pull it off, but once we decided that this is what we were going to go for, um, we kind of got into yeah. our locations, which were all just borrowed from what friends. And uh, I took some measurements. In this case, I, I did a 3D scan, and I did a, a technical previs pass. Um, because of the voiceover and the timing, the specificity of that camera move, it ended up being crucial to do this process to really work out um, that it was blocking now? and staging. Okay. As you'll see, we have a guy <laughs> in the middle of frame <laughs> operating the camera for a couple of uh -huh. these <laughs> vignettes. And this is there? what we worked with for the plan. visual effects. We had to paint them out completely uh, and replace them with the CG Next assets. Um, so this is the final version of the commercial. Enjoy your order. Whether you're stocking up.
right. Um, so one of the most fun parts of this project was the uh, the development of all these assets that we had to create uh, to in this world. And so uh, the idea was there was a system where drones would deliver shipping pods. They would drop the shipping pods into distributors. Distributors would distribute them into tubes, and from there they would be delivered into people's homes. Um, and in those homes, we had appliances called the portal. Um, and what you're looking at here are some early concepts, um, sketches of what those portals could look like. Um, and all of these designs were done by our concept designer, Matt Bell. Um, and it was a pretty extensive process for us to work out what those should be. So um, this portal had to basically be able to receive this pod open it up, it had to have a UI interface, and uh, it had to have some way of presenting you know, the order that you'd be receiving. So from those sketches, we would then go into a more um, kind of refined uh, development phase where you know, we did some rough models for that. And actually here, what you're seeing in the top row um, is, is pretty close to what we ended up with. So that was, for all our major assets, that was a pretty, uh, um, a pretty significant step of the process. And then uh, the same thing had to happen for the drone, which was probably our, you know, it was the most important asset of the movie. Um, and so the drone, again, it had to fulfill a number of purposes. It had to be able to pick up pots and deliver them. Um, it also had to be able to unfurl guns because it turns into kind of the, the villain or the nemesis uh, further on in, in the story. And we had to approach the whole thing also with the mindset of being, uh, you know, this next part corporation and think about how this drone would have to be mass manufactured, what materials would be used, et cetera. Um, and so what you're looking at here is the kind of final design of the drone uh, that we landed on. And this was kind of like our blueprint that we uh, handed off to uh, our modeler, Jonas, um, who is here in the crowd with us. <laughs> hey, Jonas. <laughs> So this is the model that uh, he came up with, and uh, this kind of you know covered everything that we needed it to do. Um, and you can see it unfurling its guns here. And then from there, we handed it off to Pavel, who is uh, joining us here today as well. And uh, he took care of the look def and shading for not just this asset, but pretty much every major asset we had on this movie. Here we go. Thank you. So I want to talk about uh, the materials in that drone. Um, when I first got uh, the model, it looked like this. <clears throat> so it's a great model, but as you can see, uh, it's not realistic. And we have here three uh, major materials, the, the light gray, sp the dark gray parts, and then the light stripes. So I had to start somewhere. <laughs> so I started with the light stripes. All I did was just make the original stripe transparent, added another one underneath, and added a texture, and here we are. And then it was time to decide um, what the drone is made of. I was thinking maybe painted metal, like R2-D2. It would, it would be easy to shade. And of course, Colin wanted plastic and carbon fiber. <laughs> so <coughs> I had to Google plastic, and um, I saw the white ones I was aiming for. So the material is set up with um, three separate uh, textures. I was painting them directly in Blender because I didn't want to deal with the, um, the seams. So I set it up so I painted separately the decals, the dirt and the scratches and the nodes took care of the rest. And then with the carbon fiber I did I used the same mm, textures for, th for this material and uh, I, I didn't have to care about whether it was carbon fiber or, or plastic, I just painted it and then added a weave, I painted the weave in GIMP and that was it. <coughs> and put together in the model it looks like this. And that was the first variant. Then I got this one. It was all rigged, animated with guns, and um, because of our wor workflow, um, actually there is none of my materials in this model, so I had to reapply everything uh, to that matched the, the parts to this model, and then had to shade 
uh, the guns, but this time, fortunately, I could do the painted metal with the guns, so it was quickly done, and here's the final version. And the final um, variant of the drone is the one that falls down and um, cracks. So it had to look believable, and it had to look um, like it's still operational, but you can see the damage. And I tried to sculpt in and um, model the cracks, the shards, and I was happy with how it looks. And then Sandra said, it looks like a cracked eggshell. So we went for something else. <laughs> and here is a singular crack, crack and some scratches. And then with a tex texture added, it looked like this. Mm, most of the damage is at the front and then some, some dirt. And <clears throat> actually the final thing I did was this shot you saw earlier in the commercial. It's the opening shot of the movie. And um, it was my favorite thing to work on. The original plate looked like this. And then I had to um, do set extension. So I modeled the furniture, matched the lighting, and then had to add some clutter to the shelves to make it look like it's something. And uh, the last thing was to animate a dummy that mimics the, the actor to, to cast the shadow, and then everything together animated looks like this. And I'm giving it back to Sandra. Thank you. So there were also a lot of uh, pretty extensive environments we had to deal with for this project. We had apartment complexes which were partially map painted and extended between Nuke and Blender. And we had um, full rooftop CG environments that were fully done in Blender. And so I'm going to hand it right back to Colin, um, who is going to talk more about his process of reprojecting and creating that environment. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about this uh, particularly challenging shot, KSG 310. Um, basically, I'm not a perfect filmmaker, and uh, the first version of this movie I put together really did not work. Uh, I screened it at work at Pixar and got some terrible, like, really harsh <laughs> critique, and uh, kind of went back to drawing board for a couple sections, and uh, decided, okay, we got to reshoot some stuff on the roof. Um, and the challenge was uh, that we didn't have access to the rooftop location any anymore. Um, so this is sort of, this was the plan for, like, one of the shots in this sequence that we needed to get. Um, the second pass got more ambitious. Um, but we found ourselves on a green screen stage to get the live action element of our lead actor. Um, and uh, the plate is to follow. Obviously, the rest of the shot had to be CG. Kind of boxed ourselves into a corner there. Not ideal. Um, but uh, essentially, the rest of the shot I put together in Blender. Um, and uh, I made a little, I guess I'm going to show the final first. So um, we were fortunate enough to have had, we've done a lot of s sort of photography of the location when we were first up there. And it was um, all taken on an overcast day, so lighting wasn't really uh, an element that we had to be too concerned about. And so I just, I made heavy use of the UV project modifier and the clone tools to basically model really rough, you know, objects piece by piece and then projected basically matching our set, our, you know, photography from the location and combined a bunch of those projections into a single UV map for, for each of these objects sort of just marching through them. Um, because it was sort of a low light situation, we got away with a lot. Um, so it was sort of just impressionistic and then adding some details, breaking up some shapes, adding some dirt, and then here's the, the shadow dummy that I uh, also animated similarly. Um, and this is sort of the, the pass that sort of came out of that. Um, and there was a lot of comp work to make this to make this sing, um, but then just animating and running out of memory. <laughs> <laughs> so all these shots are uh, environments, including the last one, CG reprojections. This is entirely a CG shot. Thank you. 
All right. So we don't have a ton of time to dive into compositing, but I just want to, uh, you know, go over a few things real quick. Um, so. Uh, just as far as rendering is concerned, we rendered a lot of it locally, and we used RenderStreet.com um, to uh, to get some of the beefier shots out. Um, we did uh, depth of field was mostly handled in comp, um, as we would normally do uh, in a production environment, just to uh, be able to control all the different elements at the same time. Um, and then motion blur was sometimes rendered and sometimes not, depending on how our render times worked out. Um, and so really what we try to do is to insert Blender into a kind of traditional VFX workflow. So, you know, we were comping in Nuke and instead of, say, rendering in V-Ray or Mantra, we wanted to just really see how seamless we can, you know, get Blender in there and it really was pretty seamless. Um, so the one thing I do want to talk about because uh, we thought it was kind of interesting to mention is that we usually do a shader breakout when we are uh, working with other render engines. And so um, the cycles uh, shader breakout um, is basically looking like this, which is um, diffuse plus glossy plus transmission plus subsurface plus emission equals your beauty render. So you can break down your beauty render into those different components, which you know um, are all additive components essentially. Um, so, and then um, each of the first four components they break down into a direct, an indirect, and a color component, um, and so knowing the math, which is showcased here, um, we can basically go ahead and do the same thing um, in any compositing package. So in this case, you're looking at a nude, uh, nuke, no graph. <laughs> it's not nude. <laughs> um, so, uh, and yeah, so basically we'd render multi-layer EXRs and each of those components would be available as its own AOV. Um, and we can just go forward here. So basically we're breaking this down and putting it back together in Nuke, which allows us to control each individual component separately. Okay. Um, yeah, hit play. Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm just jumping through real quick here, showing some of the different components. Uh, you can see the, the glossy components, the transmission components, um, and the emission over here. And so the output at the bottom matches exactly what my beauty render looks like. So now I can go in with a great node and control my glossiness separately and crank up the reflection if I desire to do so. Um, or I can go in and say uh, color correct my uh, direct diffuse if uh, for whatever reason I feel like I need to modify the color temperature of my lighting, I can have some amount of control in comp instead of having to go back and re-render the whole thing. Um, which to some of you guys might be kind of boring because it is basic within a VFX, uh, typical VFX workflow, but you know, if you're used to rendering full beauties and not really going to comp, this is I think pretty useful to know because it saves you a lot of render time. Um, so just to kind of round off, uh, not just the compositing, but kind of general work, um, we have a little uh, highlight reel, a really quick highlight reel with some before and afters to give you also um, a bit of an overview of the work that was done here.
Thank you, thank you. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit real quick about the future of Skywatch. This is a, a proof of concept short. This has always been part of a bigger dream to make something bigger. Um, and so this is uh, just a quick clip. This is the biggest conference room at Pixar. We filled the whole thing with our note cards for the, for the, uh, for the feature uh, outline that we've been, we've been working on for about the same period of time as the short itself. Um, so we are writing, 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 and we're hoping to basically pitch the short when we finally release it or pitch the feature with the short when we finally release it. Um, so we haven't really set up social media so well, but we do have a Twitter account if you want to follow us along. Um, we could really use all your help when we finally do post-publish on YouTube um, to get it out there. It would really make a lot of difference. Uh, thank you again for everyone who's supported this project or worked on it, because um, there's, there's a lot of you. Uh, really appreciate it, and thanks for having us. Thank you.